Hey, everybody on YouTube and Zoom, just want to welcome everybody in. We'll get started here in about 30 seconds once everybody gets in on both platforms. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our USA Hockey webinar series presented by BioSteel and Pure Hockey. Really excited to have a great guest on today. Actually, two great guests. Uh, Ken Martell, he's our ADM Technical Director. Um, he's been on the program hosting for a couple of times, so he's pretty much knows the ins and outs. And then really even more excited to have John O'Sullivan. And John O'Sullivan, uh, just want to welcome you to the podcast. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me on, man. Appreciate it. Hey, just want just want to just say that it seems like you know you have 167 podcasts with the Change in the Game pro project. I feel like I know you way more than you probably know me. So listen to everyone, and really excited to have you on, and um, just dive deep into you know coaching. Well, people say it's weird to hear my voice without the intro music now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll plug it in. <laughs> you, you know, Dave, for those that don't know John within our, our youth hockey realm, um, John's a widely recognized uh, figure within the sort of NGB, the coach development um, across multiple sports. Uh, people have referred to John's work you know, in, and he's affected all, more than just the sport that he's he started in. So tremendous reputation we're hoping that now we get a chance to share him with a wider hockey community and he can talk about the, the things that he's been on but uh in his journey but a long time coach that's where you started in, in soccer john still still coaching still coaching i got uh uh 12 and 13 year old boys right now which i i, I would say that middle school is my sweet spot it's what i enjoy the most like age wise of coaching kids but, but but you've got a you got experience at a lot of different levels though. Yeah, I mean I I you know, and it's funny how it connects me to hockey too. Um, you know, I, I've coached everything from you know five year olds through uh, NCAA Division One, and that was at University of Vermont. And so, obviously, you know, hockey is the big sport at UVM, and my office door was right. Um, you know, like you walk out my office door across the hall and into Gutterson ice rink and so many great players, legendary uh, hockey coach at that time, Mike Gilligan there. And, uh, um, but I, I had like this first row seat to like some of the best pickup hockey games you could ever watch. Right. I'd sit there, eat my lunch and watch uh, Marty St. Louis and John LeClaire and Aaron Miller and, you know, mm -hmm. Tim Thomas and all these guys just playing pickup hockey and going, Ugh this is pretty good. And people are like, you're like watching the Olympics here. Like, holy cow. So uh, yeah, <laughs> all connected, but everything from high school to NCAA division one to youth and everywhere in between. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what makes your background so interesting is because you were a longtime coach. And a lot of us, you know, we get into coaching because we love being around the kids and doing those things, but you've branched out into so many other areas, you know, like I think we first got exposed to you with your TED talk. And I looked today, uh, 376,000 views. Cool. So it's getting up there. It, it's pretty popular <laughs> TED talk within the youth hockey community. How did that all come about? Um, so, you know, back in to end of 2011, I was kind of burnt out on the coaching. I'd really sort of, I was running organization. I wasn't coaching much. And anyway. coaching was kind of an afterthought. And I was pretty burnt out. And so I decided to take a step back and I wrote this book, Changing the Game, and uh, started up a blog around it. That's kind of how Changing the Game Project got started. And, um, it, you know, the blog started becoming pretty popular, way more popular than the book. And because I was doing research and I like to research. And so I'd write some stuff, you know, have a thought. Let me go down that rabbit hole, see if I can find something to back it up. And when I did that... Um, the the blog started becoming popular people like yourself and other ngbs are like wow we can we can use this for us because this isn't just some guy who woke up this morning and had some idea he's actually backing it up and i found some great researchers who were you know 
happy for me to put their work into layman's terms. And so, uh, uh, yeah, then all of a sudden someone said, Hey, you want to do a Ted talk? And I was like, I, like, I don't do Ted talks. Like Simon Sinek does Ted talks, like, Oh, whatever. But I got this opportunity to do a TEDx event. Um, and, and it was great and it was really cool. Um, it was fun as the, I probably put a hundred hours into a 14 minute speech. Um, and, uh, you know, that was really early in my speaking career, but uh, it sort of catapulted it there as well, because it's kind of a nice thing to have in your resume, for sure. Well, the message, though, from a youth sport perspective, like the, we say all the time, the technical and tactical in a lot of our sports are different, but how kids grow, develop, interact, learn, all this, the environment that we, cre we create, all, all that, they're the same because kids are kids. So the message, talk about the quickly, the message in that TED talk, because I think it, it just hits across to everybody. Well, I think, you know, certainly this, the whole idea was, you know, we've got 30, 40 million kids a year playing sports, and yet 70% of them are, are done with organized sports by middle school. So what's, what are we doing wrong? And how can we make it better? And, you know, when you do a TED talk, they always um, say, well, you got to wrap it around an idea worth sharing. And so my idea worth sharing is, you know, we can change sports, we can give it back to kids. Um, if we all just start with a, the simple idea of, you know, telling our kids, I love watching you play. Now, this isn't John O'Sullivan's original idea. Um, I heard it first said from a guy named Bruce Brown. Um, I'm pretty sure it's in the Bible. Like, you know, the, these are old <laughs> ideas, loving your kids. But um it, you know, that just resonated with people and, and it, it still sticks. Like people like, Oh, you're the, I love watching you play guy. I'm like, I hope you're the, I love watching you play guy too. Like, so anyway, that, that's how it went. And it was a simple message that was sticky and, and people still remember to this day. And, and I think a little bit timeless as well. So hopefully it keeps getting a few views. Again, impacting kids every day with that that message, and it's something simple for for us as adults to grab onto, right? That, mm -hmm. That's why I think it resonated with so many of us across the NGBs. Now, you've written a couple books. Yeah. And full disclosure, I never got around to reading the first one, <laughs> um, but I am super excited about the second one because now you've gone down this journey and you've been exposed to so many coaches across all different sports. And you know, you've been able to take a lot of that information and wrap it in. So tell us a little bit about the second book here. Uh, that yeah, so my last book, which came out, you know, in, in December here of 19, was called Every Moment Matters. And it was really a coach's book. You know, the first book I wrote, it was applicable to coaches, but it was really a book for parents on how you can help your kids create the right sort of mental state to perform their best. And so when I go and speak, because I'm a coach, because I've been in coaching for so long, I always would do coaching talks and everyone's like, oh, do you have a book for us? And so I've wanted to write it for a while. And then um, in my way of procrastinating, instead of actually writing the book three years ago, I started a podcast instead. And then what I soon realized was like, wow, like the people that I'm getting to talk to on this podcast, I'm learning so much from them that I just got to ride this, you know, ride this train for a while, because this is this is the book, right? If I could synthesize these, which, you know, when I put pen to paper on the book, we're at 140 something episodes, right? Like, if, if I can synthesize this into a coherent message for people, this is, I think, what everyone should learn in coaching school, but they don't, because of our focus across many sports on X's and O's type of coaching, we, we miss this part of it. And so um, I don't think I mean, you got, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Like, I don't think there's any coach in the world who has internet access. Who's like, I can't find any drills. Like I can't find any practices to run guys help me out. Right. So <laughs> if that's not the problem, what is, well, it's our understanding that our ability to connect, to communicate, um, to build positive team dynamics. These are skills and we can learn these skills as well. And so every moment matters became, you know, interviews with people like yourself and Steve Kerr and um, Anson Durant and soccer and Cindy Timchell from lacrosse and, 
you know, all different people and sports scientists and psychologists into like, you know, how do we inspire our kids and, and how do we build great teams? And so it's, it's been doing really well, which has been, been fun. Yeah, it's just, you know, and all of us as coaches, we're all on our own individual coaching journey, but it, the longer you do it, the more, you know, you don't know everything, right. It, it, you mm -hmm. just, and to be able to collect information from so many coaches that, that, Put their heart and soul into it like that where you know they can help coaches at, at a grassroots level maybe shortcut a few things you know to to think about the right things because it isn't about the x's and o's all the time um yeah. you know, it's about that environment that we create yeah and i think as well coaching is a really it's a interesting um profession in that oftentimes we don't ask for help because it's viewed as a sign of weakness right? That I don't have all the answers. And, and yet this word coach, right? Every, you know, business executives all have coaches. Everyone has coaches, right? And, and the whole point of getting coaching is someone to give you feedback, to take you from a place that you've never been before, you know, to a place you've never been before. Um, and yet sometimes when we become a coach, then we don't get coached anymore, right? And so um, it, it's a really interesting thing that there's that resistance. But what I found is that coaches from grassroots level, all the way up to a lot of college coaches I work with, like, they just need someone to bounce ideas off of. And sometimes having someone outside of your sport to bounce the ideas off of is the most powerful thing. Because you can be the hockey guy and I can be the soccer guy. And so the ego over who knows more about their sport is gone, right? And now we can meet in the middle and the middle is coaching, I think, right? That's that's coaching. Everything else is training, right? Training sports specific coaching is much more generic, I think. And there are similarities in, in what we should be attempting, right, as coaches. And I did skim a few of the, the chapters in the book and a couple kind of jump off the page just in the chapter <laughs> titles. Like, and and that the, like, you can already go, oh, I can relate to just the title. And the first one was great on paper, uh, <laughs> crap on ice, on, on, yeah. <laughs> crap on so, grass, crap on ice. Yeah, yeah. So switch, switch grass for ice. And I think any youth coach can go, oh yeah, I, I get that. Right? Yeah. What, into a good practice then. You know, the, yeah. So, so yeah. what goes into a good practice? And that's what that was all about. And that quote comes from my friend, Chris Vanderhagen, who's the director of coach education for Belgium soccer. So a country that has gone from 60th to number one in the world rankings, what did they do right? And it was really about changing coach education around. And first of all, putting the child or putting the player at the center, right? Who's in front of me and what does he or she need in this moment based on their age and stage. And so, you know, there's a lot of practice and even, you know, I mean, sports specific research is really tough because it's really hard to create a practice environment or an athlete development environment in a lab. Right. And so there's some things that look great on paper in a lab, but they don't, they don't work. And everyone who's been coaching, who's on listening now has probably run a session that they saw someone else run and a man, it looked fantastic. And you roll it out and you're like, what a disaster, right? Why didn't that work? And was it the space? Was it the ability of the players? Did I not explain it right? What did I leave out? And so, um, it really, like that chapter is just about, okay, what, what does a great practice look like? So what are the act, you know, what are the goals, right? So let's start at the end. What am I trying to accomplish? Um, you know, what are the activities I'm going to use to accomplish that? And then I think also, how am I going to weave in our core values of our organization or our team into this teaching so that we have this dual purpose of developing people and athletes at the same time. And, and that's what I think uh, great practice design looks like. And, and I know USA hockey has been a leader in this. It's got to kind of look like the game. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and that's, I, I think even there, sometimes we struggle with what people interpret looks like the game really is just because you run through a pattern and with no resistance, no opponent, that it, doesn't necessarily mean that it's looking like the game just because conceptually the coach can kind of see something doesn't mean the players can relate to it. And that isn't yeah. necessarily all that fun either. You know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I know as a soccer player, my worst, my least favorite practices were 11 V zero pattern play. 
Mm. Like that was just like, you know, like, you know, stick a needle in my eye. I just hate it. Like give us some defenders, give us something to do. And so, yeah, it, it doesn't just mean, you know, it doesn't just mean throw out a puck and let them play either. Mm-hmm. Right. It's how do you create um, repetitions of a game like scenario um, so that players see it enough that it transfers to the actual game situation. Right. And so, um, you know, this idea of representative design mm-hmm. is so important, right? That when we break this down, um, we have to break it down at the right parts. We have to break it down in something. And it doesn't mean that there's never, ever a time for an unopposed activity, but we got to add a defender. We got to add some direction and we got to add some decisions as soon as possible if we want this to transfer. And um, too many practices spend two thirds of the time with none of those elements. And then they wonder why it looks terrible on Saturday. Well, and the ones that don't transfer tend to be the ones that aren't very fun either for the players. Exactly. Not, exactly. Is that what gets me coming back as a kid, you know, to, to what it is that we do? Yeah. Um, one of the other chapter titles in there, that turning technique into skill, it kind of ties along with that. It's one of the messages we're trying to, to get out here too. Can you talk a little bit about? That? Yeah. And so um, there's this great, the, the book, uh, David Epstein's re- recent book range sort of gave me this sort of idea amongst a bunch of things, but he, he talks about like um, the, the difference between a kind world and a wicked world. Right. And a kind learning environment is one without a lot of moving parts. So let's call that chess right? Or let's call that even like the 100 meter dash. And then on the opposite end of that spectrum would be a sport like ice hockey, would be a sport like soccer, where you're rarely playing the same pass twice because your your pass, who you pass to, where you pass it, when you pass it, how hard you pass it is determined by constantly moving opponents and parts. And so that's a wicked world. And, and sort of um, you can't practice in this kind environment with none of those conditions, if you have to compete in the wicked one. And it's a mistake to think that the only way to teach something is to make it so simple and then try to plug it into a really complex thing. The the research doesn't back that up. What the research says is, you know, it's not all random and it's not all blocked. It's a progression. So you might have something quick that shows it, and then a progression into something very random and, and, and game-like. And that's the difference between technique, which is the ability to do a motor skill, let's call it, mm-hmm. and skill, uh, a motor movement, and skill, which is the ability to deploy it in an environment in the world, right? So if I balance on a box in my room, that's not going to help me go balance on a slack line over a 100-foot canyon right? Those are two different environments. One does not help the other. Yeah. No, and I think, you know, coaches, they, they always want the answer, right? And, but I think what we've kind of said was, look, if, if you see a kid not be able to do something and you can pull them aside and you say, show me, mm-hmm. and they can actually show you that technique within some bandwidth of acceptability, coach, you decide. But if they can show it to you, then really is it a technique issue? It's right. usually an in the game under with under pressure with decisions. And so where should we be kind of heading? Not more yeah. necessarily blocked, isolated, but let's start getting them in there. Yeah, they can perform the motor movement, but before they got that puck, have they picked their head up and scanned? Mm-hmm. Do they have their head up when they have the puck? Like all these sort of things, right, is is the reason. And and hockey, much like soccer is not necessarily, uh, you know, I I might be getting out of my comfort zone here to make this claim, but I would say soccer is, it's not a game of technique. It's a game of understanding space. Mm -hmm. And if you're good at finding space at the right time, you're going to be, and and then you have the technical skill to receive a pass and shoot or whatever, you're going to be good. And hockey's very similar, right? They're both invasion sports. Yeah. Nets to defend, next attack, attack, you know, we have direction, you know, it, you know, all the same things. It's, it's create, how do you create two on ones? How do you, you know, the patterns, 
the, the, the tactics that we're using are, are very, very similar. Um, yeah, exactly. Small differences and there's no out of bounds, no place to hide in our sport. Like yeah. Just, okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. I'm sorry. But you know, <laughs> it, 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 they're, they're very similar in how we would train and how would the things that coaches would think about between the sports are very, very similar. Yeah, I think there's a lot you can learn from, from each. And certainly I think USA Hockey has done a great job with ADM and using ice space um, efficiently it is a great model for, okay, how can we use our coaching staff and our space efficiently that kids are moving and doing different things and getting to play as efficiently as possible? Because ice is maybe the most expensive thing, but there's certainly people out there paying a couple hundred bucks an hour for lighted synthetic turf fields too. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So again, you've, you've had these podcasts, you've got the book, you've been around all these, what are maybe one or two aha moments for you, either during your podcast, dealing with coaches or you know, things you took for the book that you just go, that, that was gold. Like, wow, that just, flip the way I think. Um, I'm sure there was some things along those lines. Yeah. I mean, definitely, you know, what one for me was, uh, yeah, I'll give a couple, like one was, I, I think my last trip to Colorado Springs, I was in, I was there working for USA wrestling and, um, got to spend some time with Terry Steiner, who's the women's national team wrestling coach. And he said something to this group of coaches there at this event that I was at that I was like, it stuck with me. And it's like one of the opening quotes of the book. And, and he was just telling a story that he had heard where someone asked him, what's the difference between a coach and an artist? And we're like, oh, I don't know. He goes, well, uh, an artist can throw his work out at the end of the day and start again. And a coach can't. And so that's kind of one of those aha moments for me, right? Like, mm -hmm. You know, we don't we don't get to pick and choose what kids remember. We don't get to start over again. So we have to be really intentional. So the word intentional and influence, right? Those are words that I use a lot. Um, number two, when uh, Jerry and I had Steve Kerr on our podcast, was just a, a, a just a great moment as he told us this story. How um, when he got the Golden State Warriors job. And he went and visited Pete Carroll and he wanted to create this culture like the Seahawks, the music, the positivity, the everything like that. And so Pete Carroll called him into his office and said, well, Steve, how are you going to coach your team? And he's like, uh, well, what do you mean? Like what offense, what defense? He said, no, no, no. You've, you know, you won five championships as a player. You've been around the game. You got that part. He says, what's it going to feel like when people walk into your gym? What's it going to feel like when they come to work? And Steve's like, I never really thought about that before. I thought this kind of happened. And that was Pete Carroll's big takeaway. Is like, no, this is the foundation. This is the most important thing you have to do. So go home and come up with like the 10 things that are most important to you and then cross off the bottom six and, and come up with four that you want your everyday program to feel about. And so the four for the Golden State Warriors, right? Five NBA finals in a row, three championships was number one, joy, right? We play a sport, all right? Number two, competitiveness, we, we're trying to win. Number three, compassion, like, you know, what we need to be a great supportive family. And, and number four, mindfulness, because that's what he'd learned from Phil Jackson and stuff. And he said, this is what it's supposed to feel like every day. And I think that's such a great lesson as a coach of like, I got to know what it's supposed to feel like every day. And if I get too far from that, um, I got to pull it back in. And I think for those of us who work in the youth space, certainly if it gets too far from enjoyment, something's not right. Yeah. yeah. Hey, John, I wanted to ask you, you know, I uh, watched a lot of your podcast and or listened to it, Ben, you talked about, um, asking the players to answer the question, uh, one thing that the coach doesn't know about me, or, or how do you phrase that? Yeah, so I got that. There was a book written by a teacher um, who worked in an inner city school, and, and 
she said, you know, how can I, I'll teach these kids better if I know more about them. And so she had them complete the sentence and it turned into this big Twitter hashtag, which then turned into a book. And it was like, one thing I wish my teacher knew about me that would help them coach me better. And so I just turned that into what one thing that I wish my coach knew about me that would help them coach me better is dot, dot, dot. And um, super cool because the responses that you get, um, you know, and I, and I say like, don't tell me, you know, work on my left foot. Like I'll figure that part out. Tell me something I might not know. And so this is when you learn that kids' parents are separated, that dad has cancer and nobody knows that it's really tough at home. Um, and, and I've had coaches you know, share with me that they've done that with their teams. And they found out that one of their families was homeless and they didn't know that they were living in a van, right? They saved a, a kid who was thinking of suicide because she actually wrote that in the answer there. I'm not sure that it's worth going on here anymore. And he was able to get her help. And so that sort of insight into your players enables this one-on-one -on -one connection that is like, that's the most powerful part of coaching right there. If you can connect with that human being in front of you and let them know that, you know, you're in it for them, then, um, you know, the sky's the limit. Yeah. And I think that goes hand in hand with Dr. What Dr. Jerry Lynch says about the power of one or the rule of one. I'm sorry. Can mm -hmm. you talk about that? Yeah. So this idea that we use the rule of one, one person, one comment, one time can change someone's life forever. And people ask me, well, what's a rule of one moment for you? And I'm like, Hey, when I was in 11th grade and I put no effort into a paper for my English class, I went to Catholic school in New York and, you know, the Franciscan brother, brother Jeff handed it back with a big fat F on it. And I was like, brother Jeff, like, there's no way this is an F like this is better than other people's papers. Cause I was a good student. He's like, I didn't give you an F based on what they could write. I gave you an F based on what you can write. And this is terrible. And then he's like, um, now get out of my classroom and don't come back until you decide to give me your best effort because you are a great writer. Right. And then he threw my books out the window and he kicked me out and whatever, but you are a great writer. Like that moment there, um, you know, changed my life in terms of how I saw myself. Right. And, and that same moment of, you know, you're a crap writer and this is, this is typical for you could change it as well. Right. So we never know when something like this, I'm sure I had other teachers say other things to me, but that one stuck. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, you know, I've dedicated two books to brother Jeff, <laughs> you know, and, then you know, it is funny cause he's now, he left the priesthood and he runs a, he's a president of a community college. And he looked me up like two years ago and he's like, I just saw your Ted talk and Holy cow, you wrote a book to me. And, and you know what, here's the thing. He doesn't remember that day. He doesn't remember the thing that he said that changed my life. That's how powerful we are as coaches. Yeah, teachers. And I and I think we're always watching, right? You know, they're always, always watching attention and you never know what you do. Yeah. 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 yeah and um, it's having that strength lens. Like he saw mm -hmm. what your strengths were and pushed you within, you know, giving you that good compliment. And I don't know if you're, have you heard of the motivational interviewing? With yeah. Steven yeah. Rolnick? Steven Rolnick. Yeah. yeah. Great stuff. So that really reminds me of kind of the stuff that he's, he says and he talks about you know yeah know. versus the deficit detective i think Stephen rolnick calls it yeah i yeah. love that yeah mm -hmm. so uh, in, go, go ahead dave there you go no it's all right okay so kind of just uh i know you had mark bennett on a couple of times and i was really really interested in in his stuff and you know i know you did some online mentoring with him about you know performance is a behavior, not an outcome. And I, I think that really sticks. And I think that's something that, you know, what he did with you, can you talk about your experiences with him and how that changed you? For sure. I mean, I, I don't think I've had, you know, th this would probably be, you know, you, you asked about memorable podcast things. Well, certainly the podcast guest who's been on a couple of times and influenced my own coaching has definitely been Mark. Um, and he was just on again a week ago. Um, and this whole idea that really resonates with me and sort of dovetails with this idea of the culture we create is that really what we're doing as coaches is, is we're trying to create behaviors 
right behaviors that are repeated often enough are going to lead to improvement, right? And so, you know, if we create an environment where ah, today we can be focused, tomorrow we don't have to pay attention. Hey, today we're going to compete hard. Tomorrow we're going to kind of go through the motions. You're not going to get better fast. You know, you might even get worse. Whereas what Mark would say is if we start thinking of high performance as doing the right behaviors often enough over time, right, that's going to influence your outcomes in a positive way. And so uh, I think especially those of us who work with youngest ages, right, it doesn't matter how fast they skate when they're eight or, you know, how good their stick handling is, because that's not a difference maker later on, right? It's, right, do they have the, the character traits that, we, you know, the resilience, the grit, the integrity, uh, the respect, all these other things, you know, that will get them to that next level. That's what we want. And so what Mark would teach is that, hey, as a coach, the first thing that you do is create these non-negotiable behaviors that, you know, I, we don't, you know, these are the things that we're all willing to hold each other accountable for every single day. And then what you do is you create an environment, he calls it like the rule of three, where first a player should identify for himself or herself when I'm not living up to the standard. Then if they don't call themselves on their behavior, rule two is their teammate should call them on it. And then rule, then third, the coach steps in and says something. And it's a really hard thing to do because as a coach, we're used to stepping in. And most of our athletes are used to the coach to step in to correct things, but it becomes a super powerful thing where over time players start to be like, you know what, like I've been given permission to sort out my teammate and my teammate has agreed that when I say, Hey, you need to do this, or you need to do that, that you'll listen. Um, and all of a sudden you find as a coach that you don't have to say as much. And you've got players thinking about the game and thinking about the problems on a much deeper level instead of just spitting back answers to you or waiting for the coach to tell them what to do next. And that sort of autonomy and that sort of self-organization is an incredibly powerful um, thing. And so the stuff that Mark teaches through PDS coaching, I mean, this is one of those coaching skill things that we often miss in our coaching education, but really affects the environment at such a deep level. You know, it's such a great point because we always talk about, you know, the kids taking responsibility for their development, you know, but this is turning the development process, fully engaging the kids, right, in their own development, in thinking about the game and being a full participant, not an active bystander waiting for the coach to, to give directions. So, the experience that you're creating just has to be so much better. Like what ages, I think a lot of coaches would say, well, that's great for the older guys, but like, you know, how young can, can they start to do that? I mean, Mark's got videos on his websites of seven-year-olds doing this. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think sometimes we sell our kids short in what we think that they're capable of, of doing. And so, and so therefore we never give them a chance. Mm -hmm. And then by the time they get to this age where we think that they can do it, they're so used to, um, you know, having never had to solve a problem, never come up with a solution that we just say, oh, these kids, you know, blah, they, they don't get it. They can't figure this out on their own. They need me. Instead of giving them reps when they're really young of, what did you see in that situation? Why did you skate there? What were the numbers like? Do you see any other choices you might have had in that moment? If you could do it again, would you choose something else or the same thing? One of the things I love to do at my practice now is after some absolutely fantastic movement series and then, you know, a shot, maybe they miss, maybe they score or whatever is say, great, you know, what'd you see there? Like, uh, you know, what were your other choices? What, could, what else could you have done? Um, do you agree with the choice you made? And, you know, and kids are so used to having the coach, like tell them that they're wrong, <laughs> you know? And then they're like, oh, well, maybe I could have done this. I'm like, no, I think that was perfect. Like I wouldn't have done anything different. And so I want them to have the confidence to go, no, that was the right thing, coach. I'd do it exactly the same way. Well, there is some good research, you know, when you look at creativity, for example, and how 
hey, by the time kids are 13, a lot of times we've stomped creativity out of them. Yeah. As coaches, we keep telling them what to do. So we're narrowing their focus towards what we think is the right solution. And over time, they'll focus there, but all of a sudden they lose the ability to see all the other things. Right. right? So it, it, short-term gain for maybe some long-term you know, deficit in our players' abilities. And this came, you used to come in street soccer, stickball, shinny, whatever. Like this used to come from a free play environment. And now that many kids don't have that environment anymore, like you said, you know, I, I think it's far easier to coach creativity out of people than it is to coach it into them, Right. And creativity comes from an environment where they're not afraid to make mistakes, but then they're encouraged to learn from their mistakes, right? Because the game tells you whether it was the right or the wrong thing. We practice, you know, we say this all the time, we we practice marching like soldiers, and then we want to play like artists on the the weekend. And those things don't go together, you know, like you have to let the kids express themselves. And and, you know, I'll I'll just add like one of the really interesting podcasts that I did was with a lacrosse coach named Gary Gate. Now Gary is widely considered maybe the greatest lacrosse player of all time. Uh, And he grew up in Vancouver, BC and just had this coach who, who made him and his twin brother, you know, figure it out, figure it out. And he's like, you know, this coach was so far ahead of his time and allowing us to be creative And, and Gary, like there's rules in lacrosse, because of things Gary Gate did that they created rules to prevent people from doing what he did. Right. And if you look up like him dunking over the cage in a final four and stuff, it's unbelievable. And so, um, you know, one of the things that he talked about though, is you earn the right to be creative also by practicing hard. So creativity is not just going out there and, and winging it and missing 20 shots in a row when you should pass. That's not creativity. Um, it's, it's getting a thousand reps in in practice so that when that time comes, you do it. So yeah, Steph Curry, when they're on a 2v1 fast break, he should pull up from three a lot because he's really good at it. You know, uh, Shaq shouldn't pull up from three, you know, and so sometimes we have this outcome bias of like, oh, well, he made it. So it's the right decision. Nah, not really, because statistically, that's more often than not going to be the wrong decision. And so I, I think that's the art of coaching as well as helping players recognize if that's the play you want to make, I should see out here on the ice working on that. Right. But don't just try it in the game without trying it in practice a bunch. That's about, you know, again, comes back to focusing on behavior, setting expectation, helping the players, you know, um, it, it, if you say change behavior changes their thinking. Mm-hmm. Right? So if we're focusing on the right things, uh, the right messes, the right work ethic and, and, and all that, then you know what? Let it go a little bit as long as we know you're going to give the effort. Yeah, no, totally. And I think <clears throat> that that's, that's, as a coach, if you instill the right behaviors, which we might lo- label under character, and then you move them on, you've done a fantastic job, right? Because the right players like will find, they'll f- have that intrinsic motivation to improve their game, to find the extra games, find whatever. Um, but if you give them that bedrock of great character, um, you know, I've never met a coach who's like, great player but super high character individual we don't want them well it, it isn't that what every parent wants for their child isn't that what they bring them to sport i mean if we just did that as a sport it, you know across all sports right we would have great neighbors uh great people in our society we, we would do what it is that we're supposed to do as a as a youth sport and you know what the the ones that have some ability and are willing to put the extra time and all this. So they'll, they'll matriculate to the highest levels. Well, and we'll probably have more of them because they have better resiliency and all these other things to, to do what it is. But at the end of the day, like this is back to the basics of what we should all be doing. Right. Exactly. And, and starts with, if they come back next year, right. The, the only one who doesn't get better is the one who isn't, isn't, doesn't come back. So, you know, that's definitely the key. Well, and that's, you know, we're at an interesting time right now, too, you know, because sports have been taken away from a lot of kids. And 
You know, I had a, we had, we had a discussion this morning at a work colleague who took his kid back to the ice rink. It just opened up where they could just get a couple kids out there. They went home and his wife was like, this, the joy that our, our son's glowing right now because he got to go see his friends because he got to go back to a, an environment that he, he loves, you know, it, the, the reasons why we come back to sport, right? Like that's, that's impactful. And from our end, you know, it's the difficulty right now is people planning and those things, but understanding how important sport is to our, our children. Right. Totally. And, and when we look at like, these these buckets that Amanda Visick talks about of like what makes sport great, right? Two of the you know buckets: positive team dynamics and and positive coaching and a good environment, right? I think she calls it working hard, right? And and so like these buckets are are, are so important and and recognizing. And I think this is really important for our leaders to recognize now. And I'm talking about our political leaders, right? That there's ice hockey or soccer the contact sport and there's can we get a couple of kids back together in a non-contact fashion just so they can be properly distanced but in sight of their friends right and 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 working on it and moving around the ice because that is like that's what people miss about sport Right. And that's what I think our kids are missing so much. Now we can do all the virtual practices we want and they're better than nothing, Mm -hmm. but it's still not the same as standing there face to face with your buddy. Right. Um, You know, even if you can't give them a fist bump. And, and so I hope that we're, we'll stage our return to play, not just until we can play a game, a full ice game with checking and fans. Um, we won't have any youth hockey or youth soccer like that, I think would be a mistake because it's neglecting yeah. the social emotional needs of kids. Yeah. And, and, you know, from an adult perspective, it's, this is a stressful time on the adults because it's hard for us to plan. You know, I look at our local programs out there and, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out how do we get our kids back, those, those type of things. And I think the, one of the, the greatest things that you know, families can do, you know what, go out, register, you know, come back to your local club so that they know that we, we plan on having our kids back. We'll find ways to get them involved so we can form team. We can do the things that we're allowed to do so that they can plan for the future. And, and it's just that positive step, you know, getting your kid back to the ice rink. Again, uh, our colleague could not express the amount of joy his son had he was just beside himself beaming you know, all evening long because he got to go see his friends and be a because part it, of- it's an incremental step back right and and that's yeah. what we that's where we're getting to in a lot of places now depending yeah. on where you live is incremental step back steps back and certainly here in Oregon and my county where we're starting that process and hopefully within a couple of weeks here we'll be able to put 10 kids on half a field super spaced out and say all right you know let's just do something for 50 minutes where we can tell a joke and laugh and see each other's faces instead of like having someone's frozen face on the screen because they have bad internet at least have multiple kids be able to talk at the same time like they normally multiple do. kids it, talk at the same time yeah ex- exactly because i don't know 10 weeks into uh zoom practices i mean uh, i'm running out of ideas yeah we're we're doing I, I don't know if you follow uh trevor reagan at all and learner mm-hmm. lab but trevor mm-hmm. has something so my team we're week one now of we, we call it the uh, he calls it the anti-talent show so basically everyone has to pick a skill that they've never done before and they have two weeks to try to learn it and then demonstrate it in front of their team. So um, I'm doing like juggling with, I can't juggle with balls and I haven't been practicing very much. So I'm going to totally embarrass myself, but it's fun. Like, you know, they see your coach learning something new. Mm-hmm. Um, and as a coach, I remember what it's like to learn something new. And, uh, and the players, you know, they're all trying something new as well. It just makes it just makes it kind of fun, you know, just trying to change it up. Well, in that affirmation that, you know what, coach understands that it's okay to fail to try something new. And, and if it, you don't quite get it right, that's okay. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll keep trying. We'll keep trying. Exactly. 
So John, we have a question from YouTube. Um, and uh, the coach says, my struggle as a parent is finding the balance between supporting and enabling my son to have fun and pushing slash challenging him to get better. Do you have any tips on what I can, what I can do to find that balance? Yeah, I think that's always the hard part, regardless of sport, right? And we're going to have, there's no perfect answer because there's going to be times when, you know, it's that little positive push over the edge that gets the kid on the right path. And sometimes that push at the wrong time turns them off. Um, and, and so I, I, I think this comes back to like these three key ingredients of sport performance, which are ownership, enjoyment, and intrinsic motivation, right? So what I say to that parent is <clears throat> you have to be careful that you are pushing your kid to his or her goals and not your goals, right? And um, so being aware of what their goals are and then pushing towards their goals, right? That they still enjoy it and love it and that they're intrinsically motivated to do it. I've watched with my own two teenagers, their intrinsic motivation to go out and practice and do these things that was very high in weeks one through four and dwindled a little bit and five through eight is now like almost at zero, right? But they want to go mountain biking with me, right? My daughter's got a friend and we have a, a, a river with a surf wave in it and she wants to go down to the river four days a week and do that. What am I going to say? No, stay and practice soccer. Like just do what you need to do right now to get by. Right. And, and because these couple weeks that you're not doing anything, you can make up for it if you're really intrinsic, intrinsically motivated. So this is always the challenge as a parent is you might see this ability or whatever. Now, I also think as a parent, you have the right to say, you have signed up for this team at this level that has this level of commitment required, right? And if you're not going to do X, Y, and Z, then no problem. We'll put you in the house league, right? Because that's the level of commitment that you want to make to hockey. Um, and we're not going to spend that money and that time and the travel doing something that you really don't want to do, right? And so I think those are the conversations you have with your kids on, if you make, if you commit to this, this is what it requires. And I'm just reminding you to do those things. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm forcing you to do things that you never had any interest in doing in the first place, then you're risking your relationship with your kids. Yeah, that's really good advice. It's, um, and kind of off of that, I know you coach your kids. How do you work and coach your kids? What's some advice you have? I know we have a lot of coaches in our hockey programs that coach their own kids and, you know. I mean, I could bring them in. It's not that pretty all the time, you know, <laughs> um, you know, they're, you know, one of the things, number one, I think, and I fail at this often. So I coached my daughter, you know, I coached them both when they were really young and then I stepped away and then I coached um, my daughter for about three years up until uh, a year ago. And now I coach my son. Um, and so um they're very different kids. And so their openness to me coaching or whatever is very different. Um, but I think the most important thing you can do when you coach your own kids, and I screw this up a lot, is when practice is over, take off your coaching hat and just be dad again, or just be mom. I mean, I, I that would be the biggest piece of advice I could give is that <clears throat> even if you need to wear a special metaphorical coaching hat, switch it in the car. Um, because sometimes my kids will ask me questions of like, are you asking me as your dad or as your coach? Right. Because that might, might be a different answer. And, um, and uh, you know, I'd be lying if I told you uh, that my kids haven't, you know, especially my son hasn't been in my car in tears because dad's being a jerk and not letting practice end. Right. Um, and so um, that's the thing. I think you just got to draw the line very clearly between those two things. And if your son or daughter doesn't respond to you as a coach on the ice, then have your assistant coach coach him and you coach his kid. You know what I mean? Like that sometimes is great. My daughter, she would take my coaching. My son wouldn't. So I'd always grab my assistants and be like, 
hey, tell TJ X, Y, and Z. And they'd yell it out and be like, okay, and he'd go do it. Um, if I did it, he'd be like, oh, dad, you know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's just recognizing. But sometimes when you get someone else to coach your kid and you coach theirs, it makes it better for both of you. Yeah, I think anybody that's coached their own kids can relate to that. You know, it doesn't matter what your experience level in coaching. I, I know just personal experience, my own son, the couple of years that I did get a chance to coach him, he probably got the short end of the stick um, because I couldn't take off the coach hat uh, all the time. And even though I was cognizant of it and yeah, I maybe mean, as adults, we make mistakes and I think that's okay too. The kids know that, but you know, it's, we got to work hard at it. We're the adults. Exactly. And I mean, that's why like I did a whole chapter in the book on coaching your own kid, because again, I think this oftentimes doesn't get covered in your three hour coaching course or whatever. And yet how many people do coach their own kid to start? Mm -hmm. So sure. this was just one of the things I'm like, oh, this would be really good for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Can you touch a little bit on, you know, you, you get a lot of, not a lot, but you get people say, I don't get kids these days. You know, I think they're, they're different. How would you respond to that? We raised them. <laughs> like, you know, when people are like kids these days, I'm like, well, heck, we're the parents. Like what, well, you know, wouldn't that be on us then? You know, um, I mean, I think kids are always changing, right? To think that like they've never changed in the past. I remember reading this book about John Wooden and just, you know, he was talking about when he started coaching, almost all of his players were, former soldiers. Mm -hmm. So they came in and they were like, yes, sir, no, sir, discipline, authority, order. And then, you know, you get there and all of a sudden you got Lou Alcindor, right? And you got the, the six and you got Bill Walton, the sixties and the seventies. And so John Wooden had to adapt, right? He didn't say I'm John Wooden adapt to me. He said, you know, these kids are different and they communicate differently. And, you know, and there's that great story about you know, I think it was Bill Walton showed up one, you know, thing with this great beard and John Wooden's like, Bill, come here, man, that beard looks awesome. You can't get on the bus, but it's a good looking beard, man, you know, and, and it's just like, so you don't give up your standards, but you also, you try to understand the people in front of you. So what do our kids have these days? They live in a very I generation, you know, iPads, iPods iPhones, right? Social media saying, look at me, look at me. And then we teach a we game, right? And so we have to overcome that kind of stuff. Number two, scientifically proven, they have a shorter attention span. So we better be really good at getting the right information across very quickly and getting them moving. So when I have coaches like, oh, the kids, they can't sit still. They can't, they keep interrupting and fooling around. My thing is, well, they're not running around enough because if they're running around enough and breathing hard, they wouldn't have a chance to talk. Yeah. Right. So to me, that's a, you know, that's a training design issue more so than a kid issue. So, um, and kids are pliable. So you set standards and behaviors. They come to you and realize in this rink at this moment, this is what's acceptable within this culture. This is how people like us do things here. And um, most kids fit into that really well. If you set the behavior right, the expectations right, then it's amazing how easy all the stuff on the ice that you're trying to accomplish gets accomplished. Mm -hmm. And to your point, you know, when you see little kids misbehaving, it's typically that's back on you, coach. You know, like you didn't get you know, enough. Like, Ken, I'll always remember this moment when my kids are really little and in daycare and there was this kid in daycare with them and the head of the daycare was a friend. And she said to me, like just this angelic little girl walking around and, and the head of the daycare would be like, Oh, clear your dish and do that. And she would do it. And Oh, you know, say this, move the chair. Great kid. And then she said to me one day, she's like, watch her mom's about to show up, watch what happens. And as soon as her mom shows up, it was like the demon arose yanking on her mom. And of course, you know, her mom's on the phone, not paying attention to the kid, whatever. And she just, and the head of the daycare said to me, said, so people would say what's wrong with that kid or that parent thinks that their kid has a behavior issue, 
but you know it's not the kid it's the mom it's the dad it's the environment that that kid exists in because here for eight hours the kid works fine within these rules right and so i i that's a, just a great coaching analogy we're, we're just absolutely. a different type of daycare absolutely how, how do you pass that message on to the parents and what do you do with your teams and carefully <laughs> um, <laughs> um you know i i mean i think first of all the most important thing that we can do as coaches is establish trust and you know, I can't say that I understood trust before I had my own kids, but when, you know, you have your own kids and you're like, well, this is the most important thing to the world in me. You know, my, the idea that I would trust you just because you skate faster, or you got a good slap shot. That's not trust, right? Trust is about connection. Trust is about vulnerability. Trust is about safety. Uh, trust is about walking the walk, not just talking the talk. And so, if coaches create environments of trust, um, then parents are more likely to take a step back and let you push their kid, let you be demanding, let you ask more of them. But you also have to have at appropriate times an open door, right? So that you can get feedback from that parent of is this working or not, or is something not working? And so I think when coaches, you know, close off and say, don't look at me, don't talk to me, don't email me, don't make eye contact with me, there's never going to be trust, right? And that's very, very transactional. Um, but trust is transformational. And so we have to understand that it doesn't matter what level you played hockey at, it doesn't matter all the skills you have. Um, what matters is that you are connected with, with them. And what I found in a lot of years of doing this is by building that trusting relationship, reaching out to kids through their parents, through a safe sport compliant app like Team Snap or something. Um, when I do that, what happens is um, then the parents get back and say, wow, you know, I've been noticing that too. What's going on? Or that's when you get the phone call that says, hey, my kid, the last three days, you know, hopped in the, the car after practice and broke into tears. And meanwhile, my last interaction with the kid is a fist bump. See you later, kid smiling, walking out with his friends. Mm -hmm. So what happened? And I would never know that unless I have this trusting relationship with the parent to tell me something's not right. And of course, something's not right if a kid's crying when they get in their car. And oftentimes, it's not, it's not necessarily me, mm -hmm. right? It's one of the other kids on the team being mean to them, and you don't hear it. And so... Um, that's how I think you work with parents is you lay out your philosophy, you lay out your expectations, um, you model the behaviors that you want the kids and the parents to model, and you admit when you're wrong, right? And you open the door at appropriate times for conversations and you close the door when you have to agree to disagree. And, and you walk that line differently with every family. But 10%, 20% more work up front usually saves you 90% of the work on the back end when your team starts blowing up because there is no trust. Right. right. Yeah, that's awesome. Really good advice. So uh, we want to be cognizant of your time and we just want to give you, you know, if you have anything you want to tell any of our guests, maybe about your six week coaching program. I know on YouTube, we've had two or three people write in and say how much they enjoyed it and, um, you know, got so much out of it. Oh, cool. Um, yep. So, yeah. So we just, Jerry and I, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago we were, we were like, okay, how do we cut through all the noise here? Right. How do we do something purposeful in this time? Cause I think we all know it'd be really easy to be busy. <laughs> so we're like, okay, well let's create a, um, you know, a six week online, Jerry and I and James Leith, we go live once a week. We teach something a couple of weeks on leadership, a couple of weeks on culture, week on visualization and mindfulness. Um, and we teach and we bring in some of the people live to talk about their experiences and stuff. And um, what's really interesting is, so we're like, well, let's just do it. There's a lot of noise out there. Let's see, you know, if anyone signs up and we did the first go around and we ran out of spots, like, you know, I have 250 spots in my go-to meeting and we had 270 people sign up. I'm like, whoa. Right. So, uh, so we're doing it again. And we just started last night. Um, 
and you know we already got 240 so i got like five spots left right and and i'm just it's really cool because and i thank you for the people listening who said that they've enjoyed it and i know we've had hockey coaches lacrosse coaches t- tons of sports on there grassroots to i mean nca champions right and that's what's to me is really cool is they're all there taking a deep dive on their coaching, knowing themselves better. And so, yeah, if people are interested, they can still jump on that. Um, you're they're probably the easiest way to find out if we have spots is just email me, John J O H N at change in the game project.com. Um, and, uh, or I could, I could probably email you guys the link to the thing. And, you know, but like I said, we don't have too many spots left. Um, but it's pretty cool. You know, one live session a week, they're all recorded. So if you miss it, or if you live in uh, Sweden and it's 1 a.m., you don't have to come on live. <laughs> that's that's awesome. That's the, the value there too is, is we don't coach sport, we coach people. And yeah. everything translates doesn't matter what sport you're you're involved with, right? So some great stuff. No, exactly. And, and again, we bring in, I mean, you know, Cindy Timschel just signed on for the second, right? She's a hall of fame lacrosse and field hockey coach. She's won eight NCA titles. She's there learning and sharing. Right. That's cool. So, I mean, it's like people like that are, are, are sharing their knowledge with all, all of us. And, you know, at the end of the sessions, like, you know, it's like, I got pages of notes, like I'm taking notes and Jerry's like, John, you're supposed to be speaking. I'm like, Jerry, I'm writing, like, leave me alone for a second here. So, uh, yeah, so it's really fun. But I also just, you know, people you know, just come to change in the game project.com. That's kind of the mothership and you can link to the podcast or the blog or any of the books or anything there as well. We certainly appreciate what you do in the youth sports space in sharing, uh, such a great message, uh, but not just people in, your sport of soccer, but in, in all sports. So can't thank you enough. Oh man. Well, I love what you guys do. And, you know, Ken, you and I have had many conversations over the years and I'm always learning a ton from you guys as well. So thank you for everything and your generosity across so many sports. And I hope we can do this again soon. Really appreciate it, John. Ken, thank you. Um, And just make sure tomorrow we have (coughs) goaltending with uh, Josh Robinson. And on Friday, we have the Eves family. So Mike, Beth, Ben, and Patrick are going to be on. So it's going to be a great show. And I think they're going to definitely talk about some of the stuff we probably chatted around today. So that's going to be a cool, cool show. But thanks again, John and Ken. And we will see everybody tomorrow at 3.30. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you.